So we're going to be talking about stress reduction in the classroom. And so what I wanted to show was um, kind of where we're headed with this whole thing. So first of all, you know, I know in the professional development kind of blurb, it talked about neurobiology and stuff. And, you know, I hope that's not scaring anybody off. We're going to talk a little bit about that. First, what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, the background. So my background a little bit and as it relates to um, this information and why it is that I am presenting this and why it is that I got interested in this and how it is that I came to be here and doing what I'm doing with this work. Then my intention is to talk about the neurobiology. So I'm not going to get too in detail about it. If you have further questions, let me know and I can get more into that. Um, then we're going to be talking about how to change our brain. So now that we learned a little bit about the neurobiology of stress, then we can talk about how we can do things to change that and do things to, um, to make things less stressful, essentially. <clears throat> then we're going to be taking a look at the technique uh, that we're going to be talking about today, which is called emotional freedom technique. And then I'm going to approach it or bring it into the classroom um, as something that is very doable, that's something that I do in the classroom and something that I feel like everybody can do in the classroom if you choose to. So just to start with a little bit of background, I know many of you do already know me, but for those that don't, um, I am a professor of biology here at SD4 and my background really is in nutrition. So my undergraduate degree is in human nutrition. I was going kind of the, the doctor route was my plan. I was going, you know, all set to go to med school. Um, and then I started teaching and I really, really loved it. So I ended up getting um, my master's in applied biological science, um, which included working with DNA and doing genetics and biotechnology. Um, but what I really did was in 2005, I started teaching anatomy and physiology. And so that's mainly what I've taught since 2005 um, is anatomy and physiology. And that's always been a passion of mine and something I've been interested in is the human body and um, that kind of leads me to this neurobiology and, and also the scientific perspective. I know that we all here have degrees and have done lots of um, work and things like that as far as research and, and scientific background uh, or research background perhaps. <clears throat> so that's just a little bit of my background as far as um, my education is in anatomy and physiology primarily and in biology. So after I <clears throat> went through and, and got my degrees and, and things like that and started teaching, I ended up getting into a relationship um, that was a violent relationship. Um, and it was an extremely abusive relationship that I was in for 10 years. And what this did to me, um, it was not only extremely uh, physically violent, but it was also mentally, emotionally, and, and every other way, an abusive relationship. And it got to the point where it was so extreme, um, trigger warnings, that um, I was having things like being shot at and my tires being shot out while I tried to escape and, and being strangled and losing a child and, and things like that because of the severity of the abuse. And the reason that I mentioned this is actually twofold. One, because I want to talk about why it is that I started looking at stress and how it affects the brain and, and what it is that we can do to change that. Um, and two is also just a side note. I know that all of us already know that we're working with students with different backgrounds and, and that are working with different struggles every day. But I wanted to mention this because I really wanted to kind of highlight how we really absolutely know nothing about what's going on in somebody's everyday life and what they're dealing with. You know, we, we expect them to come to class and we expect them to have done their homework and, you know, to have done the quiz or the, you know, the different assignments and things like that. But we really don't know what's going on in their life. And for the bulk and, and a lot of the violence that I was going through, I was actually working here at SC4. And even those that I was interacting with on a daily basis likely would not have ever known and, and likely didn't know what was actually going on in my home um, to the extent to where I felt like it was, it was covered very well. And I think that that's something that somebody may not realize is going on in somebody else's house because it seems so extreme, um, but really, there's kind of a division that happens. And I'm, I'm happy to talk more about uh, domestic violence. I'm gonna speak about that. And I do speak about that at, at the shelter and things like that. Um, but I just wanted to give that background because I think it's important to understand that right now, especially um, people are saying that COVID itself is causing PTSD. They're actually starting to diagnose PTSD as a, as a result of the trauma that's happened with COVID. So I think that that relates specifically to things like abuse and violence, because in my situation, because of that, the many years of abuse that I endured, I actually was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, and this is what led me really to looking at 
um, stress reduction because the, the PTSD was so bad. Um, I think that, you know, if you're not familiar with PTSD, we often think of people like, you know, veterans and things like that, that have been war. And it, it's similar. There's now an additional type of PTSD called CPTSD, which is complex PTSD. And that is rather than something like a, a veteran that has come back from a war and they, you know, have seen an explosion and, and those types of things where it's a, a traumatizing event, complex PTSD is a length of traumatizing events. It's, it's constantly being traumatized in some way. So a lot of people um, don't realize that they actually have CPTSD, particularly if they've had a traumatic childhood. And many of our students may have had exactly that. So I was diagnosed with PTSD and what this looked like for me um, was, you know, many of these things that you see here on the screen, you know, this um, avoidance, you know, this extreme anxiety, extreme depression, um, flashbacks, um, nightmares. And, and so all of these things was part of my, these things were part of my daily existence. And it was getting so bad to the point where even just waking up in the morning, I would start to have a panic attack and I would have difficulty breathing and I would be shaking and I would be near vomiting. And then to, to think about having to make something for breakfast or to eat anything, my thoughts about even having to make a decision about food would cause a panic attack. And then having to decide what to wear or what clothes to put on. Was it, was it too warm for this? Was it too cold for this? All of these things would start to cause severe panic attacks to where I was debilitated on a daily basis. Couple that with an extreme depression at times where I felt like I couldn't even get out of bed because the flashbacks and the nightmares were so debilitating um, that I struggled to even get up and even to feed myself. So <clears throat> these things were so severe that I did seek out help. Um, I started to go to a therapist and I tried to do all of the things that I think that we typically think of for stress relief. So, you know, trying to exercise, for example, you know, but when a person and, and the reason, again, that I bring up my own background on this is that when we're dealing with a person that is severely depressed or severely anxious or, or extremely anxious, either side of those, something like exercise is completely overwhelming. Um, so the idea of having to even get shoes on to, to go exercise was too much for me. It would cause a panic attack to even think of that. Um, same thing with meditation. I tried to do meditation, but sitting there with all of the flashbacks that would be coming to me, it was more like torture than it was calming because all it did was replay those tapes in my head. Um, I also tried to do yoga, same thing, that, that calmness, even though there was movement, same thing. It was very difficult to do. So I was, I was trying and, and, and for months and months and months, I tried different things. I tried, you know, I, I, I do go to therapy and I, I did go to therapy and that it has been helpful, but even with the, I've done different things like I EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization. Um, and that's supposed to help with PTSD specifically. And that was also very difficult and didn't really work out for me. I tried um, rhythmic drumming. That's why I have the drum down there. I got a drum from Africa and tried rhythmic drumming. I was trying to do anything I possibly could um, that, that I knew about and that most people talk about when they talk about stress reduction. And I really found that these things were not working for me because I was too anxious or too depressed to even get into doing these things with all of the flashbacks that were coming to me and all of that that was going on in my brain. It was too much then it was more than the regular, like, let's just take a breath. You know, I tried breathing exercises and, and, and guided meditations and things like that. And it just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And so because of this, I decided to go to what I do best, which is read and, and research. And I started taking classes and I started going to summits and I started getting all of the books on neurobiology that I could to figure out what was going on inside of my brain. Why was I so anxious? What, what was it? I, I knew, you know, I could tell myself that when I was thinking about getting something for breakfast, that it doesn't really make sense for that to cause a panic attack. You know, in, in normal people thinking about like, what am I going to eat? Because I'm hungry doesn't cause a panic attack to where I don't eat for three days straight because I can't figure out what I'm going to eat. And <clears throat> I knew something was going on because I couldn't talk myself into not having that panic attack. 
And so I wanted to find out what was going on inside of my brain that was causing it to react that way to seemingly normal situations. And so I um, started looking into psychology and neurobiology. Like I said, I was taking lectures and courses and seminars and summits. Um, I was reading names like Vessel van, van der Kolk, who's well known for researching PTSD since the Vietnam War. Um, and he's done a bulk of it. He's what has he contributed to getting PTSD in the DSM-5, which is the um, like the book of psychology disorders. Um, also Jill Bolte taylor who is a Harvard trained um, neuroscientist. I did a seminar with her. So all of these things led me to really trying to figure out what it was that was going on in my brain. And so I went through this and learned all these things because my intention was to figure out what was wrong with my brain. What, what does this PTSD mean and how has my brain changed because of it? And how do I reverse that change? How do I put the pieces back together so that I can live a normal life and I don't have all of this coming up all of the time? So what I would like to do is go through and, and give you a little bit of what it was that I learned about the neurobiology <clears throat> of the brain and how that relates to stress and how that relates to PTSD. So first, what I'd like to do is kind of start all the way at the beginning, all the way at the beginning as cave people, right? So <clears throat> if we think about the way that our brain works, really, we haven't, our human brain hasn't evolved much beyond cave person days. So if we are a cave person living out there in the wild, <clears throat> what we are doing is we are constantly on guard, right? We don't, we don't have the structure that we have now. There are things out there that can hurt us, right? There are the tigers and the bears and the lions, right? And so we're sitting here as cave people and our brain is wired specifically to look for danger. So that when we see that bush, we hear the rustling in the bush or we see the rustling in the bush or we, we hear something or, or smell something that's different, our brain automatically is going to say danger, right? Because it, it makes more sense to say danger than it does to say calm. So immediately our brain's gonna say, okay, we need to be ready to take off running, okay? Because if there's something there, our body needs to be ready to fight or to flight um, or to freeze. <clears throat> and so what we need to do is our body is hardwired for what's called a negative bias. And that negative bias has really served us. And what that means is as soon as we see something different, we automatically assume that it's negative. We automatically assume danger until proven otherwise. And that, again, is helpful, right? Because if we're sitting here calm out in the wilderness in a meditative state and we hear that rustling or see the rustling or smell something different and we say, oh, it's OK, I'm calm, it's fine. And then a tiger jumps out then you know our ancestry is done at that point, right? So really we're all here because our ancestors had this negative bias that allowed them to stay safe in their environment. <clears throat> now, when we have this happen, so we, we see that rustling in the bush or, or we hear the rustling in the bush, what's going on in our brain? <clears throat> so um, the neuroscientist that I mentioned, Jill Bolte Taylor, she's really done a lot of research in this regard. And what she has said is we are really emotional beings that think. So as we've evolved, um, as creatures in general have evolved, we keep building on more and more brain, essentially. So we have our you know, reptilian brain at the base, and then we build on more and more and more. And that's what gets us to our level of thinking, um, which is more complex and, and we have conscious thought. So we still have that emotional core in us, however, you know, that's why when we see that movement, we immediately go to our reptilian brain and say, I got to fight or I'm going to flight. <clears throat> so essentially what I have here in this image is I'm showing there's, there's a part in our brain called the amygdala, um, similar to where that first arrow is kind of pointing in, in this part of the brain. And I'm not going to get into a bunch of the detail. Again, I can, uh, for whoever wants to know more detail, certainly do that. But the amygdala is what kind of regulates whether we're safe or not. So the amygdala says, I hear something, alarm, alarm, alarm. We're in danger. We have to fight. We have to flight. And so it's going to start to send out messages. And it sends out messages in the form of neuro messages, so through our nerves. And it also sends out hormonal messages. So one that you may have heard of that eventually gets released is cortisol. You may have heard of that because we typically think of cortisol as our stress hormone. 
right? So our amygdala, um, you can see there, it's, it's seeing and hearing or smelling something. Our amygdala says danger. And then through a series of steps, we're going to be releasing cortisol as well as lots of other hormones that do various other things. What cortisol does along with these other hormones is it's going to increase our heart rate. So we increase our heart rate because again, we are going to fight or we're going to flight and we need increased blood flow to our muscles so we can run or fight. And the reason that we need increased blood flow is because we need to get oxygen to our muscles because oxygen is equals energy. And we need that energy to be able to do that running or not. And that's why I also have the lungs there because it also is going to increase our breathing. So we increase our breathing so we get more oxygen in our body and our heart starts to beat very fast so that we can get that blood going to our muscles. So that is going to allow us to then do that fight or flight, which is beneficial, right? So that's a very good thing for our ancestors. And for us, even now, if we were to, you know, almost get into an accident, for example, that increased uh, adrenaline and in cortisol is going to help us to make a very quick reaction. Now, the thing that cortisol and other hormones do also, however, is they shut down some things. So they increase the heart rate, they increase the lungs, but they also shut down things like digestion. So for example, again, we see that rustling in the bush and our body says, look, right now, we don't need to worry about digesting our breakfast. We need to focus on these muscles. We need to focus on our heart and our breathing so that we can take off running. <clears throat> so our, we shut down blood flow to our digestive system and we put it to our muscles. It also, however, shuts down this front part of our brain. So this front part of our brain is the part of our brain that has our higher thinking. So the frontal lobe or the front part of our brain <clears throat> is what does things like learning. It's what does things like remembers where we left things or put things. Um, it does things like allows us to work toward a goal. Um, for example, working towards studying for that exam or um, preparing for something at the end of the week or the end of the month or working toward a degree in the example of our students. Um, so this front lobe is what is our higher functioning, our executive functioning, things that allow us to remember things, learn things. It's our long-term memory. Um, it's where we put things together. So when we are in this fight or flight situation, not only do we increase our heart, heart rate, we increase our breathing to get that oxygen to our blood and our muscle or get the oxygen in our blood and the blood to our muscles so that we can take off if we need to we stop digesting and we stop critically thinking. And again, that makes sense, right? We don't need to be doing math equations while we're trying to decide where we're gonna run, right? We don't need to be doing high order thinking um, or learning something about ourselves when we need to fight or flight from a tiger. So these things are shut down. <clears throat> so that's a good thing when that rustling in the bush, right, is a tiger. All of that stuff happens. It's a tiger, good news, we take off running or we're ready to fight. But what happens when the rustling in the bush is not a tiger, but is instead a cute little bunny rabbit? So in this case, our body still has gone through all of those steps, right? Because remember, we have that negative bias. And, and that still applies today. It's not just in cave person days. Right now, we still have a negative bias. As soon as something changes in our environment, we automatically assume negative and still proven otherwise. So when something happens, it's automatic and it's hardwired in our brains to think bad things about it first. And then we can counteract that with different techniques. <clears throat> so in the case of this cave person, right, the wrestling in the bush, they have the increased breathing, increased heart rate, increased blood flow to the muscles. They shut down their frontal lobe. It's no longer working. Shut down digestive. It's not working. And then they see that it's a cute little rabbit, right? So instead of running, right, then they know that they can be calm. So we can be calm, but that doesn't happen immediately, right? So when we see that, that wrestling in the bush, it doesn't automatically make us calm when we see that rabbit. It takes time for all of those hormones that have been released in our body to get now be washed through our body and to be going out of the body to where it's no longer affecting it. So you may have recognized this, for example. So if you get into a near car accident, right? And say it's a really severe one and, and you stop the car afterwards and 
you're breathing hard and, and you're shaking even because you almost got into a car accident and it doesn't immediately go away when you say, okay, well, clearly I'm okay. I didn't get into the car accident. It takes time for those hormones to be broken down and, and to be reabsorbed in the body so that you're no longer feeling that effect. And the severity of that kind of cool down time depends on the severity of the, um, the external event, for example. So um, maybe if you, you accidentally go to pull out your cell phone and it falls and you think, oh no, it's broken. And you immediately have that reaction. You have that stress response. And then you see that it's not broken. That's not as severe as something like a car accident. Maybe that goes through your body a little quicker. Now that same neuroscientist, um, Joe Bolte Taylor, um, through lots of research recognized that emotions take about 90 seconds to move through our body. So in a regular stress situation, if we can get through and deal with 90 seconds of discomfort, 90 seconds of unknown, 90 seconds of stress, and work through that, then we can turn back on that frontal lobe and get back into our actual thinking brain. Um, so we're no longer just focused on muscles for fight or flight. We can click back on that higher order thinking. However, <clears throat> right? Now we're moving past caveman days, right? And now we're in a situation where we have a lot of stressors and they're all around us. <clears throat> Our brain, again, hasn't evolved so far past cave person days that it doesn't see these things as stressors anymore. anymore. So for example, instead of being worried about that rustling in the bush, now we have things like bills that are coming every month that maybe we don't have the money for. Um, maybe we have deaths, especially now with COVID. Maybe we're worried about the environment and that's seen as a stressor. Maybe we're sick or maybe a family member's sick. Maybe we have this test coming up at the end of the week and that's a stressor. Maybe we're lonely, maybe we're homeless, maybe we have work stress or maybe our students do. And so all of these things all feel the same to our brain. All of these items and any other stressful situation is seen as a tiger that could literally attack us at any moment. And so our body reacts exactly the same. So when we open up that bill or our student opens up that bill and they don't have the money to pay that bill, that is the tiger in the bush. And right now their heart rate increases, their breathing increases, all of the blood is going to their muscles so that they can fight or flight. But of course we can't fight or flight a bill and so that is constantly going through. And what, again, that does is that shutting down that frontal lobe, which is important for us as instructors, because if our students are in a situation where they're stressed in any form, whether it's because they're sick or a family member is, or because of COVID happening all around us or the environment issues or anything that is a stressor, and we know there are a lot of them right now, then that frontal lobe is not working. It's just literally not even online. Um, so to expect that that could be functional and to expect things from our students when they're stressed is a lot and perhaps too much, which is why we may see poor grades, even though a student may be really, really trying. So if we are looking at what happens when we have all of these things like bills to pay or deaths in the family or COVID or the environment and all of these things, remember our heart rate increases. So what we see are things like increased blood pressure. All right, so we have lots of increased blood pressure issues. We have heart issues now um, that are prevalent in our society. And this is because every day or perhaps most minutes of every day, a person is interacting with a tiger, right? They're seeing that bill. They're thinking about that exam. They're, they're thinking about the homework. They're thinking about their children at home. They're thinking about their elderly parents that might get sick. They have all of these things that are tiger after tiger after tiger. And so really, they are constantly in this stress situation with this high heart rate, high breathing, decreased digestion and decreased frontal lobe activity. So we have high blood pressure, which ends up being a problem. We have breathing difficulties, right? If we increase our breathing often, then we start to have breathing difficulties. <clears throat> um, you can see digestive issues. Lots of people are having digestive issues, getting not only ulcers, but really just poor digestion. So they're not getting the nutrition they need. They're getting stomach aches. And then of course, brain function, right? So we have students that are not remembering to check the syllabus, not remembering what an assignment is due, not even though we've told them this, they're not remembering that or, or not even remembering their keys, where their keys are and, and, and to plan ahead or, or things like that. So that's because our brains and our body are constantly in this fight or flight situation. 
So kind of summarizing or wrapping up the kind of neurobiology of the stress is essentially what I like to stress to my students is it's not your fault, right? So we are here today literally because our ancestors did a really good job at being stressed out, right? They did a great job at taking a look at their environment and saying, this is all dangerous and I'm going to protect myself, right? So our brain says, okay, what are we going to do? I need to protect myself. And so when we forget our keys, Right. When we um, are stressed out about this or, you know, open the bill and and our heart starts pumping or, you know, we keep forgetting different things. You know, maybe things are on our to do list and, and we drop the ball on them. Really, in the end, it's not your fault and it's not our students fault because our brains are hardwired to stop doing that critical thinking because we're in a stressful situation. Now, saying that it's not your fault. And, and understanding now why it's not your fault, now that's when we need to take the steps to do something about it, right? Because if we know something about it, and this is why I think it's important um, for students to understand stress and how it happens in our body and why it is that they can't remember things or, you know, they studied last night and they knew it all so great, but now today in the exam, I just can't remember a thing is because of this reaction. But we can do things and we can take steps to reprogram our brains. <clears throat> and so one of the things that I think people often think of is something like, okay, I just need to tell myself to calm down. I just need to tell myself to calm down. But that really doesn't work. Again, typically because that frontal lobe is not working. So we can't really learn something new at that time. When we're in that high stress state, particularly if we're thinking about an exam anxiety, right? They're very, very stressed. There's the exam in front of them, or you're about to pass it out. Um, they're in a high state of alert. And at that point, trying to listen to our brain, tell us that everything's okay. I'm going to be okay. I've got this. I studied really hard. We don't believe ourselves because again, we're emotional beings that also think. So our emotions will take control of our thinking part of our brain. The good thing is, however, that we don't have to believe ourselves. We don't have to try to calm, calm ourselves down um, because oftentimes it doesn't work. Um, sometimes it can because we can get into that pattern. Um, and depending on the level of stress, again, it depends. You know, If it's a low level stress, maybe telling ourselves that's okay, we can get that brain back online, take some breaths and it's okay. But when we're talking about being so stressed, particularly in COVID times, we're talking about really high amounts of stress. So rather than trying to go from brain to body, what scientists have learned and what a lot of research that I've looked at shows is that we can go from body to brain. So we don't have to try to tell ourselves it's going to be okay. Instead, we can use our body to communicate to our brain that we are indeed safe. And we don't have a tiger that's coming after us right now. And then we can reprogram our brain to not be reacting to all of these tigers that we're seeing, all of the bills, all of the exams, all of the stress that's around us. So you might already notice that this happens, right? So this is not necessarily new information, but now there's a lot of research on it. So for example, say we're kind of feeling down, we're bummed, or, you know, we've got the, you know, sad here in the middle of winter, we've got, you know, um, we're all down. And say, you know, regardless, a family member or a friend has to move their apartment. And so they need help and you go and help them. You might notice that even though you really didn't want to go move boxes right now, you're really down, you just wanted to hunker inside, it's cold. Once you get moving, exercising, for example, <clears throat> you start to feel better. You know, you start to have more energy. You start to be able to move more boxes. And this is because exercise is one way that we can reverse that flow. And if you'll notice, it wasn't because you told yourself like, yay, I'm going to help my friend move. This is going to be fantastic. It's going to be okay. You, you could have gone into that activity saying, this is awful. I hate this. I really don't want to do it. But at the same time, the actual action, the movement, cause that change in your brain. So there are some other ways that we can see this that are not exercise, but for example, different touches. So maybe um, some of you, when you get stressed out, you know, maybe a child does something or a friend or, or something happens and you do this with your hands, you kind of put your hands up and you're like, oh my gosh, that actually, when you do that, you're touching three points that we're going to talk about 
that actually send calming messages to your brain. So when you put your hands or put your hands on your head like this, and you kind of go like this, you're actually touching multiple points that neurologically send messages to your brain saying that you're safe. And, you know, again, there's research that's backing this up and I'll talk about that, but I'm pointing this out because the thing is, is that we're already doing these things, just not intentionally. Um, so for example, I have some of the pictures here, you know, going like this, you know, I, I picture kind of older people doing that. Oh, oh my gosh. You know, and, and this is also a point right here that we're going to talk about, you know, when we put our hands in our chest and we say, oh my goodness, or up here, oh my goodness. <clears throat> and also hugging, you know, there's a point that's underneath our arm that we're going to talk about. So when we hug somebody, we typically touch those points as well. And that helps us to calm down. And I know that we don't typically think of that, but if, if we do think back to, you know, when we do give somebody a hug, even if we're feeling really crummy or they're feeling really crummy, a hug does help. Right. And, and it, you are, I'm sure there's more going on there. I mean, we all know there's more going on there than just touching a point on the body, but at the same time, we are touching those points on the body. <laughs> so in this way, what we can do is we can use the body to reprogram the brain. And that's important because research shows that the more we use those fear centers of our brain, the more times we look around and we say, tiger, 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 the more brain cells get shifted into that pathway. So it actually does become a rut, an actual pathway that becomes strengthened because we have something called neuroplasticity, which means that we can change our brain cells. They will go where they're used, kind of like a muscle, right? A muscle, the more you use a muscle, the stronger it gets, the more energy, the more cells get built up in that muscle. If we don't use a muscle, if we're on bed rest for a long time, that muscle withers away because it's not being used. The same thing happens with our brain, which is not a muscle, but with our brain cells. If we constantly are seeing fear in all of these things around us, then we're strengthening that fear pathway. We're strengthening that stress pathway. And so then even little things are going to go directly down that fear pathway. What we do have to do though, or what we can do is that we can work on changing our brain to now go down that nice pathway, the calm pathway. And if we can then adjust things that we see in our environment right now as tigers and change those tigers to cute little kittens, then we can build up our calm pathways. And that's exactly how we can reprogram our brain. And so we can change that from fear to calm and then we get better results as far as remembering where our keys are, being more calm with our family members and not so quick to frustrate, um, you know, higher level thinking, you know, as far as remembering, you know, exam information and learning for our students. So the thing that I would like to talk about is how we're going to do this, how we are going to use our body to then communicate to our brain. So we're going to literally reprogram the brain cells. And, and I will go over the research here in just a minute. And the way that I am going to show you how to do this and the way that I do this with my students is through what's called emotional freedom technique or EFT. Um, it's also, you know, colloquially called tapping. And you'll see why that is in just a minute. <clears throat> So before I get into what it actually is, um, since we are all educators here, I think it's important to note that there is a lot of research behind this. So there's been over, when I started doing all of this research, um, which was in 2019, 2020, um, and then I've continued to keep up with the research, but even back then there were already over 250 different research articles that have been published. So journal articles and peer reviewed journals um, showing the efficacy of EFT. The American Psychological Association has given it a thumbs up. They've um, put it in their um, journal and they have said that it is an approved technique for PTSD, for anxiety, for stress, depression, and other things. The VA clinic is now using it um, for PTSD with veterans um, with great results. And I'll show you those results in just a minute. And then now um, things like the American Medical Association and Nursing Association is starting to allow um, for classes in EFT to be part of continuing education units. And they're starting to look at putting these classes in class or in, or putting these techniques 
and talking about EFT in actual classrooms for medical students and for nursing students. So, um, and this is because it is such an easy and effective technique. And I'll show you just some of the research here. Now, I don't wanna spend a, a, a whole bunch of time on it because I do wanna get into it, <clears throat> but here's one research study and I can provide all of the research to whomever is interested as well. So I have references here. So this research study shows that tapping lowers the stress hormone cortisol by 43%. Um, <clears throat> so they actually compared in this research study, they compared it to different things like regular talk therapy. They, they compared it to reading magazines and then they compared it to doing nothing. And so in this case, 43% uh, drop in cortisol with tapping rather than with any of the other things, including regular CBT, which is our clinical therapy for things like stress and, and PTSD. Another study um, showing uh, treatment for anxiety. <clears throat> so again, 76% of patients treated with EFT had complete remission and brain scans that confirm that. So they're doing things that are called fMRIs um, and they're actually showing brain scans, and I'll show you that, um, before doing EFT, so before doing sessions and after doing sessions. So um, just kind of looking at this very quickly, if you look at the image, the dark blue brain, I know it's a little bit blurry, is the normal brain, right? So the non-stressed brain. The brain that is to the right of that is our generalized anxiety disorder. So somebody that's been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. And so we can see that what would be considered good in this case, right, is that dark blue color. What would be considered bad are the, the teal and then the pink is worse and then the red would be worse. That's, that's showing the anxiety in those nervous pathways. So we can see what they look like before. And then if we look at the bottom row there, you can see after tapping four sessions. So these sessions are typically around 45 minutes to an hour of talking and tapping. And I'll show you what that means in just a few minutes. And you can see after four tapping sessions, the changes in that brain right there, which is already about half of that dark blue and it has pink and it doesn't have that dark red anymore. And then after more tapping sessions there, after the six or eight tapping sessions, eight, um, we have even more changes. And then you can see after 12 tapping sessions. Um, so typically something like um, CBT, which is like typical talk therapy for anxiety, for PTSD, they typically spend, you know, weekly hour sessions for about eight months before we see changes. In this case with EFT, they start to see similar changes in about six to eight sessions. So that's six to eight, um, you know, 45 minute or even less sometimes. There's been 90% reduction in PTSD with even one session. <clears throat> Uh, another one, which is applicable now, I think because at least in, in my area of biology, we have a lot of healthcare workers. So a lot of people that are working in healthcare and dealing with the COVID crisis uh, firsthand, um, but we see burnout in healthcare workers are reduced by tapping. <clears throat> so they reported, self-reported psychological distress, pain and cravings um, in healthcare workers. So they have taken this to hospitals that are working. Um, this particular research was done prior to COVID, um, but it's actually being brought into um, hospitals and things like this now to deal with the COVID crisis as well. Also for PTSD, so uh, relief for PTSD, so 90% drop in PTSD symptoms after six weeks of treatment. So um, there's a, a statistic, and I haven't looked at the updated one, but Last I heard, every 21 minutes, a veteran takes their own life. And a lot of this is related specifically to PTSD. And now, again, a lot of people are being diagnosed with PTSD as a result of COVID, as the result of all of this stress and, and the death and, and all of this. And so if we can see a 90% drop in that, because that's not a veteran that's come back and is not in our classrooms. We're talking about people that are in our classrooms right now that could be diagnosed or are diagnosed with PTSD as a result of perhaps being a veteran, but perhaps because they're on the front lines of this COVID um, pandemic. And then lastly, not to get into too much more research, but I have just some um, kind of general lines here. This is research that's related to specifically um, what they've looked at in students. So nursing students reduce anxiety and stress after four weeks of tapping public speaking anxiety reduced after just 45 minutes of tapping, depression for college students after three weeks was down, um, test anxiety in high school students was significantly reduced, 
math anxiety was reduced. Um, and then academic stress in general, it improved self-confidence. So they felt more confident going to school. And then down here, um, even help with dyslexia. Um, so helping with learning disabilities and, and the stress associated with learning disabilities. So there's been a lot of research that's been done not only just in the area of PTSD and, and stress and depression, but even specifically related to things like test anxiety and, and just generally being a student. <clears throat> so what I would like to do now is I would like for us to learn the tapping points and learn the techniques. So um, of course, if I can't see everybody right now, but feel free to turn your camera off if you feel uncomfortable, not you, Paul, but um, if you feel uncomfortable. Um, so right now I'm just gonna go through and show you the tapping points and show you the technique. So again, this is EFT um, and it's often called tapping. And the reason for that is of course, because we're tapping. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to touch on different points of the body and it's going to send that calming message. So what's really great about this is that similar to what I talked about when somebody hugs somebody or you put your hands on, you know, on your head and things like that, what that does, they've actually shown again through these MRI scans and things like that, they, they've actually, and I haven't gotten the research yet because it just came out, they've injected dye in these areas, these tapping points. And they've shown that when a person taps on these, it actually does send those messages. And what it does is if a person is in a high stress situation, right? Let's use the example of a student or, or even ourselves opening up a bill, right? A financial bill where we're in a situation we're trying to make ends meet, you know, especially right now with COVID, a lot of students are probably financially struggling. Um, so they open up the bill and immediately that heart rate goes up, the breathing goes up, they're starting to have, you know, um, anxiety, stress because they can't pay this bill. Now, if we at that point touch certain points on our body, then what happens is we tell our body that it's not a tiger. We say you're safe, you're calm, and everything's okay. And again, we don't have to tell ourselves that because we don't believe it, right? So we can just tell our bodies that. And then our body will say to our brain, like, no, we're safe right now because we're, you know, essentially getting a hug, right? And, and there couldn't be a tiger if we're getting a hug right now. <clears throat> so that is how we're going to reprogram our brain. Because every time that bill comes, if every time we open that bill and we get stressed, if we do this technique, then we start to program our brain to say, when we open a bill, that means calm. And then eventually our brain starts to create that pathway. So when we open the bill, typically that would go stress pathway, stress pathway. But if we open that bill and we tap, that goes calm pathway. And we start to rebuild the calming pathways in our brain. So that open the bill, calm pathway, open the bill, calm pathway. And then pretty soon when you open that bill, you say, oh, I'm okay. And there's really literally no longer a stress response. And they show that in MRI scans. So the way this works, and I have this image here, is that we are going to tap, right? So you tap with two or more fingers, and it just depends. Um, when we go through this, you can feel free just to use two fingers. But typically, the more you tap, the more you get used to using, um, you know, whatever fingers feel more comfortable. Um, and I kind of change it up depending on the location for myself. And then as we tap, you are going to tap about seven or more times. Um, so they've looked at, you know, seven to 10 times is what's done in the actual clinical EFT research. Um, but it's just general, you know, you, it's not about counting. It's not about making sure, you know, see, even as I do that, I use all four fingers on this one spot. It, it, it's just tapping these areas for multiple times are going to send that calming message to the brain. Okay, so when we do this, you know, most people use, you know, pointer and middle finger, and I'm going to show you the different points, but when you're doing it, so you're just going to tap gently. Okay. So I want everybody to do this. I can't see you, but you're on your honor here. So we're going to tap gently and you can start here and I'll show you the points. But when you tap, it's very gentle to where you can just barely feel it. Okay. So you can just barely feel it and kind of focus on that feeling. Okay. So I'm going to show you the points. The very first point is what's called the karate chop point. So the karate chop point is exactly where you would karate chop, right? If you're going to cut a board with our hand, right? In those old school movies, right? So we have this point right here and you're going to just tap 
very gently on the karate chop. Now, when you do that, you can do either hand. It doesn't matter whichever hand works best for you, whatever, you know, right-handed, left-handed, it doesn't matter. And so you're going to use your two fingers or more right on the karate chop point. So that's the first point. Right now, we're just going to go through the points and then I'll show you how to do the technique. So karate chop point is first. Then the second point is the one that I was kind of indicating, which is right at the beginning of the eyebrow. So right at the beginning of the eyebrow on that bone that's up above your eye. So right at the beginning of the eyebrow, you're gonna tap gently there. So not on the third eye spot right there so much, on the very beginning of the eyebrow. And so I do it typically on both sides, but if you wanted to, you could just do it on one side. Like when I'm driving, I'll be sitting at a red light and I'll just tap on one side. <laughs> but if you, you can do two, I typically do two, you know, when I'm at home, <clears throat> left side, right side, it doesn't matter. Then the next spot is you're going to follow that bone all the way around to the very edge of the eye. So not the temple, okay, but the very edge of the eye, right on that bone, the same spot at the very end, corners. So same thing, you're gonna tap with the two fingers. Everybody's doing this, right? And then we're gonna follow that around underneath the eye, right on the cheekbone. So right below your pupil. So again, you're gonna tap right there on the cheekbone, right below your pupil. And then same thing, gently with two fingers. Then the next one is right underneath the nose. So what I tend to do is we have this little, you know, flap of skin there. If you pull your lip down, you can feel it. It's right there. So you can kind of touch it. And, and at least for me, what I notice is it gives me a little tingle feeling on my nose. And that's how you know you've touched that point. And the more you kind of touch these points, if you are in that spot, as long as you're around the spot, that's still going to work. You're still going to get benefit from the technique. Um, but if you start to notice, um, different spots are more sensitive for different people. Um, so for me, like when we get to down here, you'll see if you try to tap away from the actual spot, it may not feel the same. You can actually feel there's a little bit of like, um, I hesitate to say soreness because it doesn't actually feel pain, but you can feel a difference. So you can try to feel for that difference. So we have under the nose and then we move to under the lip or the chin. And that's right in that dip, you know, underneath the lip, up above the chin. So right in that dip in there is the chin spot. <clears throat> Same thing, a couple of fingers. And also if you have long nails, sometimes my nails get long and it really bothers me to do it this way. I'll sometimes do it like this. So either way, you know, same thing under the nose. Sometimes I don't like if my nails get too long, it bothers me under the nose. <clears throat> um, and then the collarbone. So the collarbone, you know, you have these two bumps here of the collarbone where it's connected here to our sternum. And if you go about an inch on either side of the collarbone and an inch down, that's where you're gonna want to press. So, and that's where I was describing, if you kind of like maybe close your eyes, you can feel how that feels. And if you move to a different spot, it doesn't feel the same. You can kind of feel a little pressure point there. And these are all different pressure points. <clears throat> so that's the collarbone. Then the next one is going to be under the arm. So when you lift up your arm, it's about a hand width below the armpit. And that's where you're going to start tapping right on the side. So for women or anybody that wears a bra, it's typically on the bra strap. <clears throat> so it's right on the bra strap there. And again, some people like to do double. I don't tend to do that. I just tend to lift up one arm and, and do the under the arm there. And then our last spot is on the top of the head. So it's right in the middle. So I always imagine that if I'm going right, if I make my spine perfectly straight, it's right in the center of the head. And I tend to kind of do like four fingers there just to make sure I, I get the whole area. So right in the very top middle of the head. Good. All right. So everybody got those, right? <laughs> so... <clears throat> What I would like to do now is I want to take you through a tapping session and I'm going to walk you through this tapping session, but first I would like, how about we take maybe a couple of minutes because I want everybody to either run to the restroom, maybe get a drink, um, whatever you need. Let's take like five minutes and come back at 1155. So maybe four minutes because I want you to be ready to do this. So I don't want you to be sitting here having to go to the bathroom. So I'm going to stop talking. How about 11.55, come back and we're gonna actually do a tap. So please come back, couple minutes. If you have any questions, I'm still gonna hang out here so you can put them in the chat if you want to. Otherwise take a little four minute break and then get comfy. Maybe bring a blanket, <laughs> whatever you'd like. So.
So I'm all ready. All right, great. <laughs> so I'm going to turn some music on while we do this. And, and what I would like to do is I would really love for everybody to follow along. Um, and I'm going to show you how this has helped my students after we go through this. But I'd, I would like you to do this. So again, you can have your uh, camera off and that's fine. <clears throat> so first, everybody get comfortable. However, that is, you know, if it's sitting up straight, if it's kind of relaxing a little bit, slouching a little bit, that's fine. You know, just whatever makes you comfortable, cross-legged, not feet on the floor, that's fine. Relaxed in bed still, that's great. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is I'm going to um, say some words, okay, and then I'm going to have you repeat after me. So <clears throat> I'll say, you know, we'll be tapping, I'll tell you where to tap. And then I'll say some words and then everybody repeat after me. So since everybody's mic except for Paul, then we're not gonna be talking over each other. So, but it's good to repeat after and, and I'll talk about that at the end too. So um, echo me, <clears throat> I'm gonna also turn some relaxing music on. Um, this isn't required, it's just gonna be great for this. So, all right, so first let's take a deep breath. And out. All right, so we're going to start on the karate chop point and repeat after me. Even though I am really stressed out and very overwhelmed. Even though I am really stressed out and very overwhelmed. I accept myself and how I feel. I accept myself and how I feel. Even though I have a lot going on and I feel like there's never an end. Even though I have a lot going on and I feel like there's never an end. I accept these feelings and I'm open to them changing. I accept these feelings and I'm open to them changing. Even though I'm stressed, there's COVID and assignments to grade and assignments to post and I'm just really overwhelmed. I even accept, though, oh, go ahead. <laughs> even though I'm stressed, and there's COVID and there's assignments to grade and assignments to post. I accept how I feel and I choose to be calm. I accept how I feel and I choose to be calm. All right, now to the eyebrow. I am really, really stressed. I am really, really stressed. Side of the eye. I am really overwhelmed with everything. I am really overwhelmed with everything. Under the eye, I am, I just have too much going on. I just have too much going on. Under the nose, I am stressed and overwhelmed. I am stressed and overwhelmed. Under the mouth, the chin, I have so much to do at home and at work. I have so much to do at home and at work. Collarbone. And this COVID thing, it's just, I'm done. And this COVID thing is just, I'm done. <laughs> Under the arm, it's just too much and I'm just so sick of it. It's just too much and I'm just so sick of it. On the top of the head, I'm overwhelmed and I just don't know what to do sometimes. I'm overwhelmed and I just don't know what to do sometimes. Okay, back to the eyebrow. I'm just really stressed and anxious a lot of the time. I'm just really stressed and anxious a lot of the time. Side of the eye. And I don't know what to do, it's too much. And I don't know what to do, it's too much. Under the eye, it's overwhelming and I just don't wanna do it anymore. It's overwhelming and I just don't wanna do it anymore. Under the nose, all of this stress. All of this stress. Chin, all of this anxiety all of this anxiety. All of these things, uh, collarbone, all of these things going on. All of these things going on. 
under the arm. I'm just ready to be done with all of it. I'm just ready to be done with all of it. Top of the head. In winter, I'm really sick of that too. In winter, I'm really sick of that too. Okay. Eyebrow. But I'm open to change. But I'm open to change. Side of the eye. I'm open to things becoming easier. I'm open to things becoming easier. Under the eye. I'm open to something being different. I'm open to something being different. Under the nose. Maybe something will change and this won't be so stressful. Maybe something will change and this won't be so stressful. Chin. Because I know that stress only makes things more difficult. Because I know that stress only makes things more difficult. Collarbone. And I certainly don't need that frontal lobe to be shut down. And I certainly don't need that frontal lobe to be shut down. Under the arm. Finding my calm. Finding my calm. Top of the head. I'm open to calm. I'm open to calm. Eyebrow. I know that things are going to keep coming up. I know that things are going to keep coming up. Side of the eye. And I know that my brain is going to tell me that I need to be stressed about them. And I know that my brain is going to tell me that I need to be stressed about them. Under the eye. But I know that I can use this technique to help me calm down. But I know that I can use this technique to help me calm down. Under the nose. And it's sending these calming messages to my brain. And it's sending these calming messages to my brain. Chin. All of this calm. All of this calm. Collarbone. We're going to pause here for a moment and just think about the thing that's stressing you out the most right now. Take a breath. Under the arm, bringing in this calm. Bringing in this calm. Top of the head. I am calm now. I am calm now. All right, and you can stop tapping and take a breath. All right. So I would love to hear how that went for everybody. If you have any feedback, how do you feel, Paul? I feel a lot better. <laughs> Fantastic. So I do want to take just a couple minutes. If you guys want to chat and um, type in the chat, chat, if I can say that. See, now I'm so relaxed. I can't even talk anymore. <laughs> so again, as we're doing that, I use two hands, you know, going along and you could use one if that's easier. Um, also, um, you can adjust the point. So sometimes maybe the under the arm can be uncomfortable for some people or, you know, different parts. Oh, good, Joe. Yes. Yeah. Typically I close my eyes too. And I think that's a, a good suggestion. I, I didn't suggest that today only because I wanted to make sure everybody um, could see the points and stuff too. So that they didn't get nervous that you had to remember them, but that's fantastic. Yeah. Closing your eyes and focusing on the feeling as you're tapping on those points. So you can adjust them, you can stay longer at certain points, um, or you can skip points if they don't feel good to you, um, if that's something that bothers you. <clears throat> so good, so thanks Joe for putting that in there. Um, <clears throat> oh good, I'm so glad. So um, some improvement in anxiety there that you've been doing it for the last year, that's good. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul, saying it back. Yeah, rather than coming up with it yourself. That's good. A little mixed. Yeah, it does feel silly, uh, Janice. I, I totally agree with you there. And, and that's why I like to come in first <clears throat> um, with the science behind it because it you feel ridiculous, right? It feels totally silly um, tapping on your face. <clears throat> but 
I, I also agree with your, your last statement there is that um, the more you do it, the less silly you feel um, because it works. If you, if you do it and you kind of let go of that silliness, and I know it's hard to, at first, I, I felt the same way. I was like, this is really ridiculous. Um, so uh, absolutely good. Yeah. Glasses can get in the way sometimes um, agreed. You can kind of go around them. Um, good. And deep breathing. That's good. <clears throat> um, uh, I will answer that question, Kara, in just a minute. <clears throat> so one of the things that I wanted to mention too, is that um, in regards to like feeling really weird, oh, that's interesting, Paul, about Star Trek, <laughs> um, feeling uh, silly about it is, is again, once you get past like feeling really kind of ridiculous, <clears throat> first of all, you can be a closet tapper. Um, so for example, I suggest to, um, you know, for example, working and family, you know, parents, adults, um, when you've got kids and stuff and you're like, you know, I'm stressed, uh, going into the bathroom, like even when I'm going to the bathroom, I'll start tapping, you know, because it's like, okay, I've got, you know, 30 seconds here. I'm, I'm going to tap and it's going to calm me down and, and nobody sees it. You know, I, I'm not, you know, being ridiculous, but now like I'll be in the car at a stop sign tapping on my head. And I'm like, this is what I'm doing. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm calming myself, which is great. Cause now I'm not going to have road rage. Right. Not that I do anyway, but, um, <clears throat> so I think the more that you practice it, the less ridiculous it seems. And also as a side note, coming from a parent, um, one of the things that I realized is how transformative it can be in a family situation. Just personally, um, my child, if I start to get a little bit anxious about something, or if I say to my child, like, oh, I have a headache, they'll say like, mom, do you need to go tap? <laughs> and, and they'll give me that space to go tap because they know that it actually helps and, and they've used it as well. And so now that's kind of been incorporated into our lifestyle. So even when we talk about like busy parents or, um, you know, people that just don't have time, super busy, multiple jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I feel like there's always time like at stoplights in the car, right. Or going to the bathroom or, um, I purposely tap every single night, um, in front of my child, because I feel like it's important that they know moving forward that self-care is important and that it's not like, you know, every once in a while I'll go do this thing that's for self-care that instead it's something that we constantly are doing to make sure that we are building those pathways in our brain, that we're constantly going toward calm, toward calm, toward calm, so that in everyday life, that we are more calm and we don't go down that rut of a pathway into fear, into stress, into anxiety. Good. Um, so a question about how many times do you recommend going through the sequence? That's fantastic. And I'm going to talk about that um, right now. I'm going to not be able to see the comments anymore for a moment. <clears throat> um, so let me talk through the process that we just did. So there's essentially three steps to it, right? We did the setup statement and that was when we were on the karate chop. And I said, even though, and then this is when you state your issue, right? You say, even though, you know, we, I focused on stress and anxiety, right? Even though I'm stressed, anxious, whatever it is, I accept these feelings and I'm open to change or what clinical at EFT says is I love and accept myself. Now I didn't use that here because I, it, I feel like it feels a little hokey to say, I love and accept myself, especially when we're in like a professional development. So I chose to use words like I accept these feelings and I'm open to change. I'm, I'm open to moving forward. Um, but clinical EFT, what they do use is I love and accept myself. And then they'll say, even though, you know, whatever the issue is, I love and accept myself. And <clears throat> Um, a lot of the criticisms that people will say about tapping is this first part where we say, we're talking about the problem. We're focused on all of this negative stuff. And, and I don't want to deal with the negative stuff, right? Um, Louise Hay, um, who is well known in, from the 60s, 70s with affirmations, she says, in order to clean a room, you have to see the dirt, right? So we need to accept and not push away, thanks Paul, not push away um, the anxiety or push away those feelings because it's like a beach ball being pushed underwater, right? If we take that beach ball and we say, I don't wanna feel this anxiety, I don't need to feel this stress, we keep pushing it away, pushing it away, pushing it away, it's gonna come up and hit us with a lot more force if, and rather than us just dealing with the beach ball in front of us at the time and then and moving it out of the way because we've worked through it rather than trying to shove that beach ball down and it come back and hit us in the face when we least expect it. So we need to talk through the problem. And what's really fantastic that they've looked at, you know, from a psychological point of view, and also from a neurological point of view, is that 
This is a way to actually integrate these feelings and work through them in the brain. So the first part you, I often tell people I'm a a practitioner and I often tell people just complain, like say there's somebody in front of you and you're just complaining like this sucks. I hate this. This is the worst, you know, just complain. And you do that while you're tapping on all the points, you just keep complaining, keep complaining and everything, bring it all in there, you know, throw all the stuff in there that's making you annoyed or frustrated or anxious or whatever it is, and then just keep tapping. So the answer to, you know, how many rounds or how many times is really depending on how you're feeling. You know, I um, am still going through as a result of my background with the abuse and stuff. I still go through, I'm going through lots of court dates and, and lots of, you know, battles and legal stuff and all of this stuff. And so, you know, sometimes I'm super, super anxious and, and frustrated and I will pace the house. I'll pace the house as I'm tapping, talking about how upset I am or how frustrated I am. And I just do that that until you get to kind of a shift. Okay. So, and, and you can really feel this when it's you working on yourself or you working with somebody. Um, and, you know, I've worked with people where they were talking about something and complaining and complaining and complaining. And then when they were repeating me about this complaint, then what they, I could tell they would start to laugh about their complaining. They're like, yeah, it really does suck. You know, and there's not that energy anymore behind it. They're not super angry or they're not super frustrated anymore. There's kind of a shift because they've gotten all of that out. And really they actually have, they've integrated into their body. And rather than pushing away that anger and saying, I shouldn't be angry. They're trying their best. It's okay. That just builds and builds and builds like that beach ball. And, you know, they say whatever, you know, whatever you resist persists, right? It's not talking about that pink elephant in the room. All you're going to think about is that frustration, that pink elephant, right? So instead, what we need to do is acknowledge that there's a pink elephant in the room and deal with that pink elephant. And then once we deal with that pink elephant, we complain, we complain, we complain in a safe space. Then once we feel that shift, then we tap in the positive. Then we say what we want to be. And that's why when we moved and then I talked about the stress and the anxiety and COVID and even the winter weather and all of this stuff. And then I said, but, you know, I'm open to things changing. And so when it's something that's really big, you know, something that it seems really not changeable, like say a bill, right? Like I have to pay the rent or I have to pay the medical bill or I have to pay the whatever, like that literally is not going away. Right. But you can say, you know what, maybe I'm going to get some extra money. I'm open to that. Like, yeah, I don't believe it, but you know, I'm open to that changing. You know, I'm open to there being a solution. I'm open to something happening that I don't foresee right now. And that little bit of being open is again, creating that brain pathway. You're putting more cells into the calm, more cells into the the possibility of this not being the end of the world, this not being the tiger in the bush that you need to fight or you need to run from. And so you're building that up. And so again, you know, you tap through all of the negative. And then once you kind of feel that shift where you're like, okay, I think, I think I'm done complaining about this now, then what you're going to do is you start to tap in the positive and you start to think about that calm or you, you know, you think about the solution to your problem. And oftentimes what will happen is because remember what we're doing is we, at the beginning, because we're complaining, we're frustrated, we're upset, we're anxious, whatever it is, we have shut down that front part of our brain. So as we start to tap and we start to get out of the fight or flight, that front part of our brain starts to come online again. And what often happens when a person is really intent in tapping is a solution just starts to present itself Um, because our creative thinking, because our executive functioning is now back online. And we didn't see that as a possibility before. We had absolutely no way of seeing that because our front brain was literally not connected to our body at the time, we've shut it down. And so once we start to tap, we can start to be like, oh yeah, there was, you know, that money that I put away for the rainy day or whatever, you know, oh yeah, that's right. My mom said that she would loan me money, you know, and and that would be great. And we can start to be open to those possibilities, even if we absolutely don't think that there's a way that we could ever solve that problem. So then tapping the positive and again, feeling until there's that shift, until you feel like, okay, I'm done now. I'm I'm calm and I can move forward and I, you know, am thinking clearly again. And then I always like to end on a deep breath to just kind of let go of all of that and move into the rest of the day or the night or whatever it happens to be. So um, that's kind of the, the 
steps to take. You know, I, I, I talk about it in three steps, you know, the setup statement um, where you're just on the karate chop the whole time talking about, even though this issue, I, you know, accept myself or I accept these feelings or, or however you feel comfortable saying that. And then you shift to complaints, you know, talking about the problem. <clears throat> and then you shift to positive, you know, talking about the positive, building that new pathway. And then relax and take a breath and move on with your day. <clears throat> so I, I did see some things pop up in chat and I um, intend on answering those questions, but maybe I will wait until the end if that's okay. <clears throat> um, because I do want to get to, oh, we've got, we're good on time. So EFT in the classroom. So the other part of this, you know, we have talked about the research, we've talked about the neurobiology, we've talked about tapping, and now you know how to do the tapping. Now the question is, how on earth do we get this in the classroom? Like, how, how do we do this with students? And I saw one of the questions, like, how do students ever feel comfortable doing this? Um, it, I don't think it was as extreme as I just said that, but something like that. And um, so I can tell you that um, I started looking into all of this and, and researching everything that I possibly could it, starting in 2019. And then, of course, COVID came in 2020. <clears throat> and then, you know, I really was seeing because of all of the stress surrounding COVID that I really wanted to do something to help my students. Um, I really, really felt like everybody can benefit from stress reduction. And I didn't want to put out there something like meditation, which everybody's, or maybe not everybody, but most people have heard of, but can be really difficult. And, in, and if somebody doesn't approach it in a way that's constructive, can really be defeating and, and frustrating because you can't clear your mind, which is what people think you need to do, um, which is not, but that's another thing. So <clears throat> when we talk about stress reduction, what I've done is I've incorporated stress reduction unit in my classes. So the way I've done this is I have my regular syllabus um, with all of my assignments for the whole semester in each one of my classes and in the points laid out and everything like I normally do. But then what I've done is about a month into the semester. So once students have gotten past the stress of the first week, once person, um, students have gotten past, you know, the second week where they started to turn in assignments, then they've gotten into the third week where they're kind of used to the flow of my class. They kind of get what they're supposed to do. They're getting the hang of things. Then on the fourth week, typically, I throw in this stress reduction unit. So I don't put it in my syllabus or anything because I don't want them to think about it and stress out about it. So I put an announcement talking all about the stress reduction unit and my intentions with it, which is to reduce their stress and to help them. And I promise them that it will not take a huge amount of time. I make the due date all the way at the end of the semester. Um, and the whole thing, it's actually five different modules. And out of those five modules, they all together will take only about 45 minutes. Um, a student can take more if they choose to, but it'll take only about 45 minutes. So I'm asking only 45 minutes more of them in a whole semester, essentially. So I split it up into five modules. Um, the first module is a quick 15 minute video of me going over kind of what we'd already talked about, which is the biology of stress. Um, so I, I talk about the fight or flight, I talk about the rustling in the bush and, and that brain pathway <clears throat> and very, very quickly. And so that's the first one. So all they have to do, I use Edpuzzle, which is um, if you don't use it, it's where you can post um, a video and then embed questions in it. And really I make it very, very simple. I, I post the video and I embed a question at the end just saying, basically, did you watch this? And then they click yes and then they get the points for it because I don't want it to be stressful. Um, so they watch that video that unlocks the second module. Um, the second module, what I have in there is a video going over this, the tapping points. So actually watching, it's not myself, but it's another person talking about the different points and pointing out where they're at and how to go through that process. Again, it's an Ed Puzzle video. It's only like, you know, 10 minutes long. So they watch that and then answer, yes, I watched it at the end. And then that's the second module. Then that unlocks the third module. <clears throat> the third module is the one that they like the least, but it's the way that I, I actually um, assign points to this. So it's a required assignment in my class. And I, I'll talk more about that, but I did that because we all do feel so ridiculous tapping on our face. And I feel like if a student sees what they're going to be doing, they're gonna say, no, thanks, that's stupid. I'm not gonna do that. Um, when in fact, 
every single student. So I've been doing this since 2020, or I think it was actually the first semester of 21. Um, so at least, you know, including summers, like five, six semesters, um, every single student has told me that they felt like it was beneficial. So every single student has said, yes, I'm glad you posted this. Yes, I think it's beneficial. And yes, I think you should share it every semester. And, and that's actually the fifth module. So um, let me get back to the third. The third module is I post um, a gentleman named Brad Yates. He has a YouTube channel with lots and lots of EFT taps. <clears throat> and so I post that video and I require the students record themselves tapping. So this is where they feel silly, but I ensure to them that all I'm looking for is participation. You know, if they get messed up, if they say the words wrong because they're trying to repeat and they're getting messed up, I don't care. It's just to show that they're participating. So I have them record themselves and turn in the recording. And then they get the points for that. That then unlocks module four. In module four, I have 20 plus videos posted in there. Um, again, Ed Puzzle videos. So they just watch it and they say, yes, they watched it. <clears throat> so, and they are on all sorts of different tapping. Um, topics. So I tell them out of the 20 plus, they have to choose two to complete any two. And I have everything from cigarette smoking, you know, quitting cigarette smoking to anxiety, to um, racial stress, to um, childhood trauma, um, <clears throat> to weight loss, you know, anything, you know, I, I keep adding more every semester as well. So I keep trying to add more and more so that students can pick, you know, any exam stress, a class anxiety, you know, things like that. So they can choose any two out of all of them that they feel like would be helpful. Um, so they complete those two once they do, then the fifth module unlocks. And the fifth module is just feedback for me. I ask them, what did you not like? What did you like? And should I share this in the future? And, and that's given me the feedback that I needed. I felt like, to move forward with doing this every single semester. Because again, all I've gotten is positive feedback. Um, some people, of course, the negative is I feel ridiculous. I don't like recording myself, but I get why I had to, you know, because I only teach online. <clears throat> so I have them record it. And then that's my proof that they're actually participating and actually completing the assignments um, to the best of my ability, because I don't have them record themselves when they do the two in the next, in module four, part four, because I feel like, them feeling ridiculous um, is going to take away from the benefit they can get from the technique. So just having that one video, I feel like it's good enough for me to say, okay, I'm gonna trust you that you're gonna do the next two. And often students have done more than two and I tell them they can do more than two um, and it's only gonna benefit their grade if they do more than two because they'll have you know more points um, for their overall grade. So that's how I've incorporated it into my classes. And again, I've gotten great um, responses, great reviews, and I'm gonna talk about some of the feedback I've gotten from students in just a minute. But first I wanna say, how can you incorporate this into your classroom? And so I've kind of put um, some different levels of difficulty here on how you could incorporate this into your classroom. So the easiest level, I think would be to provide an EFT handout to your students. So um, last year I worked with David Getz um, and the best team to um, develop this EFT um, pamphlet or, or just little handout. So it talks a little bit about EFT. It talks a little bit about how it helps with stress and it has an image of the points there and it has some links for students that they can go to, um, some links to a TED talk that Dr. Peter Stapleton did, who's done a lot of the fMRI research on um, tapping. And it has my contact information on the bottom so they can reach me and, and talk to me and ask me any questions. So I feel like if anything, um, I can get this to you and so can David Getz, but um, I have this, I can, I can send you this PDF or this Word document. You can even post it in your online classes and just say, hey, here's this thing that's really easy or hand out in your classes and say, here's this thing, really, really easy. So that's one step that you could do. <clears throat> the next step, which I think is doable, right, is to provide the stress reduction canvas course to your students. So um, you saw here, I had my, my little card here. So I've created a whole separate Canvas course. Um, and I created it with the intention for you all, if you wanted to, to use it and incorporate it into your classes. So I've worked with Ann Hilton um, to make it look beautiful and wonderful. And it does, thanks to Ann Hilton and Ann Forte. And um, I have two parts 
to this course. One part I've called the continuous stress reduction module. And this continuous stress reduction module is non-credit, right? So if, you know, this doable level is just to say, hey, students, um, there's this course out there. I'm going to add my class to it. So um, Anne Forte is able to bring all your students and add them to this additional course, Canvas course, <clears throat> so that they can access it. And the continuous stress reduction module is where I am posting stress reduction techniques. So it starts with EFT, but um, my intention also is to add things like meditation techniques and guided meditations and, and other types of stress relieving techniques as well. And that's all just at their leisure, however they want, whatever pace they want. So no credit involved. So that's doable. They can just access that if they want to. If you wanna be heroic, however, you can provide stress reduction canvas course to your students for points. So also in that stress, in that canvas course, I have a credit modules that are worth credit or points. So it goes into the grade book in the canvas course. So that's what I use. That's the, the five modules that I laid out for you just a moment ago. So if you wanted to do that, you could just add that to your class for whatever amount of points you wanted to um, have that same structure. You don't have to do anything still except for let myself or Ann Forte know that you want to add your class to that. And then you can go in and you can see what they've completed or you can ask me and I'll go in and I'll just tell you what they've completed so that we can help the students. And that won't add too much, right? to your course load or to anything that you would need to do. Lastly, if you wanna be legendary, you could walk through the students through an EFT session before each exam, because we've seen the huge drop in anxiety that comes with doing EFT. Now this one, the reason I said legendary is because, you know, first the students may feel totally ridiculous, right? And so that was a question, Kara, is how do you um, get past the students feeling ridiculous? Personally, I put it online, and if I were teaching this and wanted to do this in the class where I would walk students through it, I would still have them go through and do at least the first couple modules online and do the recording online so that they get over the initial ridiculous feeling. Um, and they, they realize like, okay, we're all doing this ridiculous thing. I'm doing it at home by myself right now. Um, and then if you wanted to incorporate it in your class and be legendary, um, I would recommend saying that people close their eyes, you know, because then they can't see each other, right? So they're closing their eyes and, the, and by that time they'll know the points. And if you put a YouTube video on, right? Even you don't have to be the one that walks them through. There are lots of YouTube videos. I can get you channels for that. And they'll say, you know, eyebrow. And then you repeat after them. And then you say side of eye. And, and they'll say those points. So everybody can have their eyes closed. They've already done the points and nobody has to see each other when they're doing it. And so then, and they know everybody around them is doing it, they're doing it, and then you can be doing it as well. And so that's how I would approach being in the classroom and having students do it. Um, and I would do that um, because I think that it provides enough of a benefit to do that. And there are specific YouTube posts out there where they walk through, you know, for students, literally right before an exam, here's a tap you can do for students. So I just wanted to put up um, kind of at the end here, <clears throat> I wanted to put up some student feedback. So, you know, again, I do ask students for feedback, you know, regarding what they liked, what they didn't like, um, and if they wanted to tell me any more information. So this student is one of my all time favorite um, emails. So they didn't even put this in their feedback in the module. They sent me an email right away. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read it, but the highlighted points I think are the important ones. So it says, although I was worried this unit would add to my workload for the week, it actually made me more inclined to get my work done and be more productive. As a person that really struggles with stress and anxiety, I never knew why my brain felt so foggy all of the time. I just thought I was dumb, honestly. After learning that my laziness and poor decision-making could be influenced by stress, that completely made me rethink my life and myself. Personally, my high anxiety brain always moved too fast for my body and mind to process. And I would trip on my words, forget things that I just learned and rely on others to make choices for me. By recognizing what is actually happening in my brain, I can use the tapping technique to help slow down and calm myself. I'm not going to lie, it's going to be a hard habit to get into, but if I can actually utilize tapping on a regular basis, I think that I can excel later in life. 
As a person going into a biology career, I have always feared that I am too scatterbrained and messy, but if tapping can help me to organize my thoughts and feelings, I can finally feel at ease while trying to reach my goals. And then I would suggest this unit to everyone. In fact, I actually played a few of the tapping videos with my friends and family already. I know that I got pretty personal this paragraph, but um, these are my thoughts and feelings on the subject. So this one really struck me because she even spoke to me more after this and really described to me that she was considering dropping out of school because she thought that she was done. She thought that she, you know, why couldn't she succeed at this? And she actually has a history of anxiety and she had never had those two things put together for her. And after this, she had said, I now feel like I can move forward, continue my degree and utilize this technique because it actually works for me. And I feel more confident moving forward. And I really felt like, you know, obviously this is exactly why I wanted to include this was because you know, people aren't realizing the effects of stress on the body and how much it's playing a role, even just, you know, things like forgetting our keys, you know, like, where are my keys? Why do I keep forgetting my keys? This is ridiculous. It's because your brain is so stressed out that you're, you're not thinking about where did I keep my keys? Because you're going to go fight a tiger right now. Who cares where your keys are at? So I thought that was a great feedback. Um, this is a text I just got from a student this semester. And again, just the highlighted part there. I didn't want to cut the, the text weirdly. So, um, and this was just random. They sent this. I haven't even opened up the last of the modules, but I just wanted to thank you for adding these stress reduction assignments. This lets us know that you truly care beyond just teaching this course. So that was a lot of the feedback I got as well, is a lot of the students said to me um, in their feedback or even separately that by including these things, it made them know that we care about them that we understand that, you know, whether it's COVID or whether it's not, that we really do care about their success. And I feel like we all do already. And it's just letting them know that. And I found that in this way, without even meaning to, you know, a lot of students have said like, not, you know, I can see that you really care about us because you put this in here and it's helped me do better in your class. And I appreciate that because, you know, biology is hard or science is hard. So, um, I just have, you know, a couple more of these, but again, the thoughtfulness of including this in the class, it really shows that you care about your students' mental health and want to give them the tools. Um, they said they're going to use it throughout the rest of their life. Uh, otherwise they wouldn't have known about this technique. Um, just kind of the same thing, you know, saying that they really appreciated. Um, and, and again, so many people said, yes, this should be included. Yes. You should tell other instructors about it. <clears throat> um, this student's mentioning how well it works how it's crazy that it's so easy, that it has such an enormous effect um, and that it just takes a couple minutes and that they can use it for anything. So after a few days, they found themselves more calm and ready to take on the day. <clears throat> and then they found themselves doing this at work, at home and at school. So, and I, I have also had some conversations with um, parents who have said, you know, like when my kids are stressing me out, like now I have a tool that makes it so I don't freak out on them. So I don't yell at them um, because I don't want to yell at them. And it calms me down enough to not do that. So, and this is just the last one. Um, similar to the other ones, I just wanted to show that the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. So, um, and even this person said, you know, I'm skeptical. I was skeptical. You know, a lot of people are skeptical. I was skeptical and I get it because it seems totally ridiculous, right? So I'm skeptical. This person also says, I'm not a fan of touching my own skin. I don't like doing that. I know it's weird to say, it's just who I am, but they didn't mind tapping on their, on their chest or their head. So they modified it because they didn't like touching certain areas. Um, but then they also said that they liked it because it allowed them to accept and admit their fears and their failures, because that's part of the process. You can't just skip over that. You know, you can't in order to, again, to clean up the room, you have to see the mess. So we have to acknowledge that mess and then clean that up. So um, and then they even said this month has been really stressful with school and work and bad news. Um, and that this really has helped them through there and, and that they're going to be, you know, they subscribe to this gentleman's channel and they're going to be using it for moving forward. So, um, so overwhelmingly positive reviews. Um, I also, um, obviously, you know, you all can reach me at SC4 anyway, but I also have, um, I use Remind, which is a text app. So I use it in all my classes, but I also have a separate, you know, class for mental health. And it, it's what I have on the bottom of the pamphlet that I worked with David Getz to create, to give to students as that um, for the EFT technique. So if anybody has any questions, they can always text me there, you know, any students, if they have any questions, or, you know, I even say to students, if they, 
you know, want any help, you know, finding a counselor or, you know, any help beyond even what I can do. You know, I've had students contact me and say, thank you so much for providing this. Like they were literally the next day about to check themselves into a mental health facility because they're so stressed out and they were talking to their counselor and they didn't know what to do. Um, and so we, we talked through it. And, and I suggested the tapping and, and to help them calm down. And so they've utilized that along with their counselor, of course, um, to move forward and deal with that. So um, feel free to share, you know, my text information there that goes, you know, directly to my text and my phone. And that's specific for mental health. So in, and it can be anonymous, you know, students don't have to put their name in the Remind app. Um, and that's one of the things that I really like about it, too, is that anybody can contact me and say, I'm really struggling with this or, you know, anything like that. And I can put them toward different areas and different resources, whether it is to help them with tapping, whether it is to help them, you know, find resources otherwise for their mental health. So um, that is all I have to share with you all today. But um, I do want to answer any questions. And, and I know that I probably missed some in the chat. Maybe I'll have to scroll um, back up here. Does anybody have anything? Go ahead, Paul. I don't know if you have anything to add in here while I scroll up in the chat. Well, um, all I have to add at this point is this is everything you promised it would be. And, and you have done so much of the work for us that I can't imagine not taking you up on your offer to steal your intellectual property and present it as my own. So I'm definitely going to do that. Please do. Everybody steal away. <laughs> That's what it's there for. Take it. <laughs> Good. I hope so. Um... Let's see, I'm, I'm seeing some of these other, yeah, meditation techniques. And, you know, um, Linnea, that the interesting thing is that um, they have done studies where they've looked at um, the tapping specifically adds a level to that. So they have done tapping where, you know, they have taken away the words, you know, so they've done just the tapping with no speaking. They've also done tapping on points that are not those points, you know, so totally random points on the body. Um, and then they've done a mix of all of those things and they showed that it actually is physically these points on the body. Um, and there's been a long-term Harvard study that's done on acupuncture and acupressure points. And these are actual, um, these points are some of the points that Harvard was looking at in this really long study that they had done. And they show that it's actually the tapping and yes, all of the, you know, like the anchor point and, and focusing on the breathing and focusing on the feeling and, and centering and things like that are part of it. And it absolutely adds to it. Um, but it's interesting because they've shown, you know, with these MRIs and things like that, that if you remove the tapping part, you don't get the same response um, as you would with, you know, meditation and, and, and other visualization techniques. So it really does add a level, um, another level to the the whole meditation and grounding oneself and, and centering oneself as well. So um, good. So Tammy, yeah, absolutely. Um, if anybody wants to send me an email, then that would be best rather than um, in the chat. So to add to Canvas um, and I can send that PDF, I have it um, and I can send that to you. And I'm so glad that you'll add it to your classroom. It, it's been so wonderful and the students have been so thankful. Um, Let's see, are there any tapping videos geared towards disordered eating? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are, you know, kind of big names in the industry. And um, one of them is the tapping solution. And I, and I can get all of this information for everybody. Um, but the tapping solution is actually a family that live in Newtown, Connecticut, where the, the shooting was that, you know, the first one with the kids. Um, and they have gone into the community and done a lot with tapping. And um, they as a family actually have created this, the tapping solution, which is a big name. Oh, and I wanted to mention there's a tapping summit coming up, but at any rate, um, they've written books and, and the sister of that family has written an entire book on um, weight loss and, and body confidence and disordered eating surrounding um, tapping. And in fact, um, the doctor, Dr. Peter Stapleton, who I mentioned earlier, a lot of her research, she was actually working as a psychologist in a weight loss clinic. And they said, we'd like you to do research. And she chose to do research on tapping. And a lot of the fMRI, how it started was her doing research on tapping. And it's fascinating because she would have, um, they, she would have people that are addicted to food, you know, overeating, um, bring in to, to this um, uh, clinical 
uh, research study, the food that they're most addicted to, you know, the chocolate cake or the chocolate bars or, or whatever it was, they, they brought it in and they had to have it sitting in front of them, right? So everybody had their most loved food in front of them. And then they ate all of it and they enjoyed it. And then they did a- fMRI scans, right? So they did fMRI scans where they actually showed them pictures, images of all of their favorite foods. Um, and they did this the next day after, you know, before they had breakfast, before they had anything. So they were all starving. Um, and they were laying there watching all their favorite foods and they can see where those parts in the brain would light up, you know, where they're craving these foods. And they did a tapping session. And then after that, they looked at the fMRIs and that craving was completely gone. And they actually did a couple more. I think they did four total. And then a year later they followed up. So they didn't talk to these people for a year, a year later, they followed up. And they said, Hey, do you remember being in the study? And they would say, Oh yeah, I remember being in the study. And then they said, do you remember what food you brought in? And most of the people said, I don't remember what food I brought in. I- I'm not sure. And they would say, you know, it was chocolate cake. Right. And they're like, Oh yeah, that's right. It's chocolate cake. And they're like, I haven't had a chocolate cake since then. And they actually will say they haven't been eating it. They haven't had, you know, any cravings for that food since they did the tapping. And then they followed up two years later. So far it's been two years and they still don't have those cravings and they have got gained control of their overall weight. So um, so, uh, with, sorry, anorexia, um, you know, I am not sure about that, but I can look into that because my guess is yes, because there's a lot of like body confidence tapping and going along with the body confidence obviously is just being comfortable in one's own body. Um, and I can look into that, but I'm pretty confident that that is in there as well. Um, I haven't seen that specifically, but I certainly can look for that and let you know. Um, let's see, might add these for extra credit over spring break. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the thing is that I, I don't want anything to take away from the students um, and them feeling like it's more. And, and that's why I also included that feedback from that one student that said, like, when I saw it, I was like, oh, great, more assignments. And then they said, like, actually, I did it. And it made me more efficient at doing my schoolwork that week. You know, so I felt like, okay, I feel justified in, in putting more work on you. <laughs> um, and, and so what I've done now so that people don't wait all the way into the end of the semester is I've made module one have a due date of the first month of the semester, module two, the second month, then the third month. Um, and those are loose deadlines. I tell them up front, like, if it doesn't get done by then, that's okay. But at least it's on your to-do list. So, so you're aware of that coming up. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, so adding it for extra credit, I think is great. The reason that I do add it for points is because, you know, as we know, only certain students are going to do extra credit, right? And maybe it's the students, and I'm not saying anything bad, Janice, about doing extra credit, because that was my plan intentionally was to be like, oh, this will be extra credit. And what I found personally was I wanted to force my students to do it, (laughs) because oftentimes it's the students that won't do it that need it the most, right? Because they're the ones that are like, I don't have time for extra credit. I'm just going to get what I get or, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I've forced everybody to do it and um, they've so far been thankful for it. <laughs> so good. So any other questions or anything that I can answer or um, anything at all? It's been a pleasure. I, I'm really excited to um, be here sharing this with you all. Oh yeah. So next week um, I can put this information out there if anybody is interested as well. Um, Every year, there is a um, a tapping summit um, put on by the the tapping solution people, but it brings in all of the, you know, big names, people that are doing the research across the world um, on, you know, tapping and and things like that. And um, it's a a 10 day plus 11th bonus day of tapping. It's all free. Um, You get 24 hours access each day to, you know, the talks and things like that. Um, So if anybody's interested in that, it starts uh, next week, the 20, I think it's the 28th that starts. Um, Yeah, next week. And this is, I think, the 15th annual um, and over a million people showed up last year. So um, it's really a big thing. And, and it, it can answer many questions that you might have for tapping if you have any other questions as well um, regarding, you know, changing it up, regarding how to apply it to certain things, you know, um, 
addiction. It's used a lot in addiction as well, not even just food addiction, but um, actual other drug addictions and, and alcoholism and things like that. So it can be very helpful. So uh, let me know if you want any information regarding the uh, summit as well, because I can certainly get that to you. Good. So any other questions? I think I'm going to, um, absolutely, you are welcome. I just posted in the chat the um, document for what is tapping. That document is the one that um, David Getz and I had worked on. And also the people that I keep mentioning, the tapping solution people, um, <clears throat> what I'm posting right now in the chat, you're welcome, thank you, um, is research. Um, so like the people I mentioned, the tapping solution, um, they have kind of put together a pretty little pamphlet, um, little packet that talks about all the different research studies that have been done. So you can go in there. That's a lot of the research that I linked to that I had in my presentation. So you can go back in there and see, you know, where that information is at so that you have the, um, the information to back me up. <laughs> um, and, and so that's there as well. So they have their, the PDF I just put in there, the TS-science-data um, is all of the research that I talked about um, and, and more, in fact. So absolutely. Thank you, Colleen. <laughs> Great. So again, um, email me if you want any of that stuff. If you don't grab it from here, let me know if you want the, the paper that uh, David Getz and I worked on. Any of the research information, I'm happy to share that. Any of the YouTube channels, I'm happy to share those um, or anything else. <laughs> Questions? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do have one question for you, Brandis. Sure. Um, so obviously you, you talked um, about your own situation and that was really uh, very uh, great of you to be willing to share that with us. And so it, it seems like you in your own life wanted some stress reduction, but I'm wondering how you came upon this. Did you do a broad literature search of stress reduction techniques mm -hmm. and find this one that way? Or was there, did someone share it with you? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. Um, yeah, and regarding my background, um, I'm happy to share anything about that with anybody. Just as a side note, if anybody is interested in domestic violence, abuse, um, I do talk about it at, you know, at events and things like that. So I'm happy to share any of that information, including why did you stay? Because I know that's a big question. I'm happy to answer anything. Um, so Yes, I, I started on the path of, you know, like I said, the typical kind of stress reduction things. And when I started to really get into the neurobiology aspect of it, saying like, why does my brain work the way that it's working now? Um, and how do I fix it? How do I make it go back to where it's not like this all the time? Um, I was starting to read um, uh, Bessel van der Kolk really was the one that opened me up to different techniques. Um, his book, The Body Keeps the Score, talks a lot about how um, even though like our brain might not be concerned about certain things and maybe we think we've moved past something and, and we're not really traumatized by that thing that happened way back when, that our body actually stores that information inside of it. Um, and that's from years of, you know, like I said, you, he started working with um, Vietnam vets um, and in, in clinics and he works at John Hopkins and things like that. And, um, and so he actually, in his book that I read, talks about all these different techniques that he uses with PTSD uh, or with people diagnosed with PTSD. So, and I went through a lot of those as well. So like EMDR is the eye movement desensitization. I also use bilateral um, movement and sounds um, which is another way to integrate between the two sides of the brain. Um, so I, I do that and I have different touch sensors to help with that. Um, and so in reading that book, he kind of laid out all of these things. But really, even though I was reading that, I was kind of going through each of these things that he was suggesting. Um, I was actually at like a super, super low point of depression. And I was like, I give up on everything. And I said, I can't do anything else to try to fix this. And um, I, 
I got an email just because I was on some email thing um, regarding a summit on depression. And I said, I'm, I don't have the ability to say I'm going to do anything that's presented in this summit. And I'm not going to tell myself I'm going to, what I'm going to tell myself I'm going to do is lay in bed and just listen to what they have to say. And listening to what they had to say, someone talked about tapping and talked about the function of it in the brain. And I thought, well, I can't exercise. I can't meditate. I can't, you know, I can't do all these things. I've tried. I've tried for over a year at that point. I had tried to do all these other things. Um, and I was like, I can do that. And so um, happenstance, um, the tapping summit was like the next week. And so I, I went through the whole tapping summit and found immediate, re immediate relief at the end of the tapping summit. Um, and then that's when I decided that this was something important enough that I wanted to share it with other people. And so then I went on to get certifications um, in the techniques so that I could share it with other people and, and talk about it. Um, and I've even, you know, I still, I don't just do the tapping. Like I said, I still do the bilateral movement. Um, I still go to my counselor every week. I still, and I actually, interestingly, but totally aside, I purchased a neurofeedback machine that I use in my house and I hook up EKGs to myself or EEGs rather, um, to myself and, and do neurofeedback as well. So it's been a path um, but the one that has helped the most and is the easiest to share and to do on a regular basis is the tapping. And so that's how it kind of became a part of what I do regularly. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. I really, I sort of pictured you going through just as you described, probably being very scientific and looking at a lot of different options. So that's great. Absolutely. That's exactly how I did it. <laughs> yeah. Looking at all the research, going to PubMed, typing it in. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> good. So, oh, good. I'm glad it relaxed you, Kat. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it can help with asthma. So, so many of these things, um, because it decreases the cortisol, right? So since it decreases the cortisol and it decreases those stress hormones, um, it allows like, like for asthma, like you mentioned, it allows you to open up those pathways because it decreases the inflammation, all of those inflammatory things. And actually I didn't mention it in, um, in the lecture, but they've shown that um, something called epigenetics, where what we do environmentally affects our actual DNA and our genes. They've shown that just one tapping session actually changes up to 72 genes in our actual DNA. Um, plainly speaking, you know, we have our genes either switch on or off, right? Let's just keep it at that, right? They'll switch on and, and that means we're making those things and then, or they can switch off and we're not making those things. So, um, due to tapping, they've actually looked at DNA and they show that it's changed 72 genes and, and turned off those stress genes and turned on beneficial genes. So I'm glad for that, um, for you. Yeah. It, it can decrease that inflammatory response. Absolutely. I'm glad it helped. Um, let's see a success in STEM. Good. Let's see. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I would love to be a part of that and, and talk more about that. Absolutely, Joe. <clears throat> Good. Yeah. And, and this is exactly why, um, just aside our DEI, why I want to talk about neurodiversity, right? Because I'm neurodivergent um, because of PTSD. So, um, and, and working with that and, and understanding, like, for example, um, uh, I had a, a really, really big, I call them incidents um, of abuse right before a training that we did right before the semester had started. And it was the one where we had the speaker, it was one back when we all got together, right? We had the speaker that um, was showing the hate. Um, like, I just remember on the fraternity where they had the banners. Uh, I don't remember the whole thing, but it was so triggering for me that I was biting through my tongue, trying to deal with all of the flashbacks that were coming back to me. And, um, and related to that, you know, that's where it was like, <clears throat> it, it's uh, being aware of these things, being aware that we don't know what's going on in people's lives, you know, that we don't know what's just happened to them the day before. Um, and then when we're talking about things in class, you know, knowing where they're coming from. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think that that's great with neurodiversity. Yeah. Um, yeah, Linnea reached out to me. Um, absolutely, because that is exactly what I do. I, I, I work with the domestic violence um, 
um, shelter here. And that's the thing too, I had students come, you know, each semester, just a side note on the violence on the, the DB front, um, each semester, so in, uh, what are we in winter, fall semester, um, October is domestic, domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, so I have my students do something related to that. Um, and then during this semester, we have Sexual Violence Awareness Month. And so I have my students do something related to that. So I can kind of slide it in both ways because I want students to be aware of it. There's a lot of, especially domestic violence now because of COVID and a lot of um, things that, you know, teen dating violence and things like that. So um, I can certainly um, get things to them and, and connect them. Just just send me an email, Linnea, and I'm happy to reach out, you know, and, and anybody that um, wants to talk about that aspect, or even just anybody that's not a student that wants to talk about EFT. Um, like I said, I, I do presentations and I do trainings based on it. And so I'm happy to reach out to anybody else um, if they're interested in that um, in any in any regard, just let me know. Well, I will jump in here to, um, to conclude, although Brandis obviously is free to stay on and the rest of you are free to continue to ply her with questions if you wish. Some of us have a um, DEI meeting to go to in a couple of minutes. So I'll just make some just final comments to say on behalf of the Professional Development Committee, we want to extend a really sincere thanks to Brandis for providing this really excellent session. The feedback already is telling you, Brandis, how useful people have found it, but I really think it's one of our best sessions. Oh, and I'll thanks. remind everybody to contact Brandis if you want the materials that she said and contact Ann Forte if you want your class added to her Canvas class. And um, so thank you very much for attending and I will take my leave now. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>